Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. And uh, we'll start with the second portion of the presentation here. And I will pick up right where Dr. Friedman left off with the aircraft coming to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. So this is October 2005 when the aircraft was brought to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. But I would like to make um, a couple of points first. Why does all this really matter? What's important about the Memphis Bell? You know, it, it's certainly a famous airplane, but there are lots of things that we see in the media that are famous that are really not important. The, uh, the most important element of the Memphis Bell is that it is an American icon. It's one of those touchstones in our history that reflect who we are and some of the best of what we are. And on the slide you see on the upper left-hand side is uh, the Arizona at Pearl Harbor. On the bottom left is the famous flag that was raised at Mount Suribachi, which ironically was also not the first flag <laughs> raised at Mount Suribachi, much like the Memphis Bell. Of course, there's a monument to that uh, flag raising. Those images, those objects are things that are touchstones in our history and the Memphis Bell is another one of those great American icons. The Memphis Bell is a symbol of the heavy bomber crews that, that fought and flew and sacrificed in order to help defeat Nazi Germany. And they did play a very important and critical role in defeating that evil regime. The Memphis Bell, it, Bell is the symbol of the heavy bomber crews and all the support personnel who, who made that happen. And, um, why is that important, or why does that matter? What did the heavy bombers crews do? Well, they helped us win the war, for one, but significantly also, they did it at an enormous price. And they sacrificed to a degree that the Air Force had never seen before or since. Half of the Air Force's combat deaths in its entire history were heavy bomber crews in B-17s and B-24s fighting against Germany. The numbers are truly staggering. Uh, more than 30,000 heavy bomber crewmen lost their lives in combat in the fight against Germany. There's another important aspect that's directly related to the U.S. Air Force, and that's the very creation of the U.S. Air Force as a separate service. The heavy bomber campaign over Europe in World War II was a, a grand experiment. It had never been done before to that scale and to using that tactic of flying at high altitude in daylight using a precision bomb site or at least precision bomb site for the time, not by today's standards, and trying to attack the enemy's ability to prosecute war, destroy their infrastructure, destroy their manufacturing facilities, destroy their energy facilities with the idea that that would cripple them. Well, the first time this was done to this scale was the U.S. Army Air Force's heavy bomber campaign in Europe. And that campaign, the success of that campaign, along with the success of the campaign uh, against Japan, directly led to the creation of the U.S. Air Force in 1947. And this is why. A lot of the other functions of air power before then directly supported the Army or the ground forces. So um, this would be a close air attack or or close air strikes, interdiction, transport, things like that. If those are the missions, then there really, there really isn't good reasoning to have a separate service. But this idea that air power can be decisive, it can strike far behind enemy lines, that, th those are grounds that's reasoning to have the uh, Air Force as a separate service, and indeed, that's what happened. So with the Memphis Bell Project here at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, it really has three elements, and I'm going to talk about those three elements. Uh, the first is the restoration, and, and I, I, just ha I cannot say more positive things about our restoration staff. These people are absolutely amazing. I have watched them work on, on more than 60 restorations, and they are craftsmen who are unmatched um, in the country or in the world. They, they work on aircraft from World War I, wood wire and fabric aircraft and turn around and then work on modern aircraft that have composites and everything in between. And they are very careful about how they restore aircraft and they are meticulous. And in the case of the Memphis Bell in particular, um, they have treated that aircraft as the national icon and treasure that it is. 
Uh, in this photo in the, on the top, uh, you see the restoration crew that have worked on the Memphis Bell all of these years. So in 2005, when the Memphis Bell came to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, uh, the, the main concern was corrosion, uh, identifying it, and treating it. And these, these are a few pictures of the Memphis Bell when it came to the museum in 2005. So the priority was uh, further disassemble the aircraft, remove all the paint inside and outside, and uh, then assess and treat the corrosion. So for the first several years of the restoration, that was the focus. I would like to make the point that on the exterior, there was no original paint. So those photos where you've seen the nose art that, were, that was on the aircraft and it was here, that is not the original nose art. So original nose art paint was not stripped off. So here's a photo of the rear fuselage. On the upper left is as the aircraft was when it came to the museum, and on the bottom right is after it was stripped. Now you can imagine the time that it, it, it took our restoration craftsmen to remove the paint with the formers and stringers and nooks and crannies. It certainly wasn't a flat surface, and the Memphis Bell is not a small aircraft. They also stripped the paint on the exterior, so you see in the upper left is the tail turret, and on the bottom right is after the paint was stripped, and again, that was not original paint to the aircraft. One of the delightful discoveries, and I'm sure the folks in Memphis already knew this, but when the paint was removed from the exterior, all of these names that were carved into the aircraft were revealed, and it, it's, it's kind of laughable now. Could you imagine going to an air show and going up to an F-16? <laughs> if you can even get to the F-16 before you get tackled. But nevertheless, there were hundreds of these names carved into the skin of the aircraft. Those are all covered now by paint. However, uh, we took photographs of the, all of the names, and we also documented those by station number, so where it was at on the aircraft. And we've actually had a few requests over the years uh, asking, hey, my grandfather said that he carved his name into the airplane and we've been able to confirm that. So while the stripping and assessment and treating with corrosion was going on, we were doing research at archives around the country. Uh, we made three trips to the National Archives in College Park, and on one of those trips, Dr. Harry Friedman accompanied us. It was really an enjoyable trip. And then we also worked with the Air Force Historical Research Agency to get literally tens of thousands of pages of documentation from the 8th Air Force Service Command, which was the outfit that was responsible for modifications in the 8th Air Force. And then we also traveled to the Boeing archives in Washington State. The, probably the most valuable source was the National Archives in College Park. We obtained more than 5,000 scans of documents. So located there were the original combat records of the 91st Bomb Group. So all of the crew lists for all the missions, the intel debriefs, uh, orders that came from the first bomb wing, orders sent, uh, uh, reports sent back to the first bomb wing. The, the level of detail in these documents is truly extraordinary. And here's a photo of a few of those. This is the interrogation form or the debriefing form that came from the Memphis Bell crew on their 25th mission on May 17, 1943. So it was quite remarkable to hold in our hands the very documents that the intel officer held and wrote as he interrogated the Memphis Bell crew after they finished their 25th mission. And what's kind of interesting is if you look, um, if you look on the tail gunner, it says Major W. Weiler, photographer. And, uh, Major Weiler, the famous director, was on the Memphis Bell with the crew on their 25th mission. Quite remarkable. So um, as, as Dr. Friedman talked about all these details about uh, who was on the airplane at what time and so on and so forth, this was a, a wonderful source to be able to document that. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, we have all of the crews that flew on the Memphis Bell. There were 54 airmen who were credited with flying at least one combat mission on the Memphis Bell. We know who they all are. Here's another great document. Uh, Dr. Friedman talked about um, the victory claims for the Memphis Bell crew, and we've chosen to, we've chosen the number seven because uh, Tony Nastal was part of the Memphis Bell crew because he went on the war bond tour. Um, it depends on who's included as part of the crew, and, and uh, some of those victories were on other aircraft. 
Well, this particular document, and this is why we know for sure, all of the victory claims by the Memphis Bell crew members or any members of the 91st Bomb Group are located in these combat records at the National Archives. So there are actually two copies of each claim. The first one is the handwritten one as the intel officer is uh, uh, asking the gunner, you know, what happened and where were you and so on. And then he typed it up very neatly. This is the one that was typed up very neatly. And then they stamped it, whether it was destroyed, probable, damaged, or no claim. So th this is official. And what you're looking at here is the uh, official claim by Bill Winchell for an FW-190 on the crew's 25th mission on May 17, 1943. And you can see that uh, it was stamped destroyed. So another incredible source of information, and, and I, uh, in, in the 20 years that I've been here, I've never had the kind of um, primary source documentation and, and visual documentation and reference than we've had for the Memphis Bell. And a lot of it has to do with the outtakes from the William Wyler movie and the work of him and his film crew that went over. There are 11 and a half hours of outtake footage. About three hours of it is duplication, um, some of, of varying quality. But there are literally hours and hours of footage in color of the Memphis Bell, along with other heavy bombers and heavy bomber operations of the 8th Air Force during this time period from late 1942. And then it actually goes into the war bond tour into the midsummer of 1943 with the Memphis Bell. And it has been invaluable in making sure that we get the configuration of the aircraft correct, that we get the markings correct. What you're looking at here on the upper uh, right, that image was taken in early January 1943. So this is about two months into the Memphis Bell's combat tour. And you'll notice that there are only a handful of bombs painted on the nose. There are no swastikas, there are no stars. And if you look in the nose, there aren't great big 50 caliber machine guns because actually that was a combat modification that was done on the second half of the Memphis Bells tour. So when it went, first went over there in about the first half of the combat tour, they had 30 caliber machine guns, which were virtually useless to the point that sometimes they didn't even carry them, like you see here with the Memphis Bell. On the bottom left, you see the Memphis Bell about this same time. The Norden bomb site is in the nose, which was very unusual. That, uh, that normally didn't happen. That might have been a security slip. And then you see on the right-hand side, there are no bombs at all. So the bombs on the right were added um, later on. Um, so what, are those, what does that evidence do for us? What, what, what does this do in these outtakes? Well, it is in some cases the only visual information we have in order to restore the aircraft correctly. When the Memphis Bell was in combat, the 8th Air Force had no modification system. In fact, when they went over, there were no plans for a mod combat modification system. The British had warned us about that, told us that we should be doing that, but we just didn't do it. The only modifications were planned were to correct defects from the factory. So it was a only about the time that the Memphis Bell was coming back that the 8th Air Force rationalized its modification program, and then we start seeing documents. We start seeing drawings and things like that. So with the Memphis Bell, Sometimes these modifications were done in the hangars at Bassingbourne. There's no record but the visual record. So what you're looking at here are the reinforcements that allowed 50 caliber machine guns to go into the nose of the Memphis Bell. We know there were 200 of these kits made. We know that they were made at Langford Lodge and we even know when they were shipped, but there are no drawings. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side are two stills from the outtakes. And these stills, along with several others, were taken by restoration craftsmen. And you see on the right the fabricated pieces that are installed on the Memphis Bell now. Absolutely amazing that these guys can take just images and turn them into reality, and it is identical. That's one example where the outtakes have helped us. Um, again, the modifications weren't just things that were done at Bassingbourne, but in some cases, the Memphis Bell was fitted with British equipment. Now in that case, we've been fortunate that uh, there were drawings that were found. So what you're looking at here is something that we uh, call the towel rack for obvious reasons. On the bottom left, you see a close up and on the upper right, you see uh, an example of that on the bell. And it was a navigation and landing system. 
And on the bottom right, you see that towel rack as it's installed in the Memphis Bell today. That was fabricated from scratch. And that was not on the aircraft when it came to the museum. Here's another example of a modification that's a British system. On the upper left-hand side, you can see that uh, there's a four-light array that's next to the uh, normal tail light on the, on the left-hand side. On the bottom left, that's how the tail looked as it came when it came to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. And on the bottom right, you see that newly fabricated piece installed on the Memphis Bell. In that case, there were drawings that were found. And again, it is absolutely identical to how it was on the Memphis Bell in 1943. Another way that the outtakes have helped us are with marking the aircraft properly. And uh, as you heard uh, Dr. Friedman talk about, there are so many myths and so many, uh, um, so many things about the Bell that are not accurate. And the markings were equally challenging in that uh, some of the markings were added later, um, some were before they finished the combat tour, so we really had to pick a point in time, and there's a, there's a reason why this image is on this slide. That is when, right after the Memphis Bell crew finished their 25th mission. The reason why you don't see it in the movie is because something got messed up with the film, probably when it was developed. So it's got the blue line in it, and it just wasn't used. And what you see is kind of a staged moment in time. But this is the Memphis Bell right after they finished the 25th mission and the crew chief, Joe Jambrone, is painting on the 25th bomb. So we basically had kind of two choices with how to mark the aircraft. It could be painted as it was shortly after the 25th mission, which you see on the top photo, or it could be painted as it was after the public affairs folks got a hold of it and uh, it went on the war bond tour and highlighted you see some of the markings that were added sometime after the combat tour, probably about two and a half or three weeks after the combat tour. They added more stars to the row of bombs on the right-hand side. The most obvious are the eight swastikas that are underneath the bombs, but they also added crew names. There were also many other markings that were added to the airplane, and we, we, we've come to name those publicity markings. So on the left-hand side, there, were, there was a list of missions. Those are not the Memphis Bell's missions. Those are Bob Morgan's missions. And then on the right-hand side, you see the swastikas again. And then on the upper left, you see where it says Sally, and there are swastikas there. Well, shortly after the 25th mission, the only thing in that spot was the letter S. So we had to make a decision which one would we choose to do. And we chose to represent the aircraft as it was when it was still in a combat unit and shortly after they finished the combat tour. So the Memphis Bell has been restored and painted as it appeared shortly after they finished the combat tour. Now, some of these photos and this interpretation is very important to the story of the bell, certainly, and that will be in the exhibit. But the artifact itself will be represented as it was shortly after they finished the combat tour. And with the markings of the aircraft, another challenge was the colors. And um, Olive Drab has a very unusual um, problem in getting accurate because it, it uses several different pigments, and it's very difficult to make lighter or darker without it shifting into a different color or a different shade. And then in the case of the Memphis Bell's olive drab, there was a, uh, a paint called Dark Olive Drab 41, and it was incredibly unstable in sunlight or in UV, and it was so bad that there are actually two period articles specifically about that paint discussing how it breaks down. And it breaks down in different ways. Sometimes it goes brown, sometimes it goes purple. Um, and so in the, in the case of the Memphis Bell, we had all this great footage in the outtakes, but there's different times of day, the exposures are different, so there was a, there was a little bit of art in trying to determine. And also with these colors, the vertical tail was a different shade of olive drab, and then the control surfaces were a lighter shade yet. So there was a lot of hand wringing trying to get these colors accurate. And one of the methods that we used was to take these colors and turn them into black and white to see if we get the lightness and darkness correct. We also used a color system called the Munsell system, which allows us to, to shift colors in a very precise way. But I would point out, for instance, in the case of the control surfaces, there were more than 25 mixes made to try and get that color right. And I can't say enough for the guys in restoration 
and for the gentleman in Tennessee who, who worked the paint, that, that they stayed with it until we got those colors just right. So here's an example of some of the great source material that we have with, with getting the colors and markings correct. Here are stills from the outtakes, and the markings package for the Memphis Bell is very thick. Um, it's about 100 pages, but I would like to make the point that it doesn't matter that we're able to capture these images and that we know how the airplane was marked if the markings and paint were not executed well and our uh, specialists, our craftsmen in restoration have done an absolutely magnificent job of replicating these markings. If something was painted on sloppily in 1943, they have replicated that perfectly. And so when you see the bell after the opening, take a look and see where you can see where bombs are not quite uh, even, where swastikas are, are not quite symmetric. I'd like to point out one thing that they did on the National insignia on the left-hand side, it's actually slightly clockwise. That's not something I'd noticed, but one of, our, one of our guys in restoration noticed that by counting rivets. So that's not perfectly straight up and down. It's uh, rotated slightly clockwise. Another element of the, of the markings, the nose art, that was something of a surprise to us is that uh, her hair was not neatly parted in the middle like it was in the George Petty illustration. And that caused some consternation because it was really rather messy. And the name of the piece is, I'm the one with the part in the back. How can the Memphis Bell on the airplane not have a part in the back? Well, our restoration craftsmen, uh, two of them painted the nose art, one on each side. They're incredibly talented and they have replicated her hair and the rest of the nose art Id identical to, to what it appeared like on the airplane in 1943. And it's interesting how there were other differences from the left side and the right side beyond the color of the bathing suit. Uh, the Memphis bow on the left is blonde, the Memphis bow on the right is a brunette. There are some detail differences in the way the shoes are and things like that, and those have been replicated perfectly. Another example of the level of detail that, that we have gone to with the restoration of the aircraft are the decals on the, on the airplane. There are a number of decals on the Memphis Bell inside and out. And this is an example on the upper left is a close-in shot of the Memphis Bell just below the data block and you can see that decal. And those are water transfer decals. On the right hand side you see the, the blueprint which our restoration staff has all the blue, copies of all the blueprints of the decals. That's the example for this particular decal. And on the bottom left is how the Memphis Bell appears today. And, and not only have restoration staff been careful about making sure that the decals are the right size and so on and so forth, but all of the correct fonts are in there as well. It, it was a really interesting Art Deco font that Boeing used. So last month, the Memphis Bell moved to the World War II gallery and, and we celebrated uh, its uh, transport over to its permanent home in our World War II gallery. And uh, the Memphis Bell is in place today and right now the exhibit is being installed um, as we speak, literally as we speak, uh, so that it will be ready for the public opening on May 17th. So here are a couple of, uh, of the uh, panels that will be going in, into the exhibit along with uh, some of the artifacts. And um, here's a basic layout of the Memphis Bell and Strategic Bombing Exhibit. So on May 17th, the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force is going to open up two major exhibits. One about the Memphis Bell and, and its full story, and then that will be surrounded by an exhibit about the strategic bombing campaign in Europe in World War II. And what you're seeing in green is the Memphis Bell exhibit, and then in blue is the strategic bombing exhibit. And so just as the Bell in history represents the heavy bomber crews and all that they did, the Memphis Bell will also be the centerpiece to help tell the larger story of strategic bombardment in Europe in World War II. And on the left-hand side, you see this drawing. Now, the Bell has been given privileged space in the gallery. It's displayed in such a way that visitors will be able to walk all the way around the aircraft and our, our visitors will be able to get close to the aircraft without uh, touching it or damaging it. So, and one of the really beautiful sights that we will all see is that from the time that you get just past the P-40, it's about 230 feet, there will be a line of sight right to the left side of the Memphis Bell's nose. So it will be very dramatic. And then the area out in front of the Memphis Bell, 
uh, will be completely open. So uh, there will be a lot of space to kind of uh, take the site in, see the nose art, um, and it will be uh, very dramatic. So the families of the Memphis Bell have been incredibly generous. We, we contacted and tracked down family members and they willingly donated artifacts. It's very difficult to try some 75 years after the fact to try and collect artifacts from something as very specific as the Memphis Bell. But we will have artifacts from seven of the Memphis Bell crew members on display. And what's quite remarkable is thanks to a, a really exciting exhibit design, those artifacts will be on display literally in the shadow of the aircraft. It will be in the presence of the aircraft. And we're looking at some of the artifacts here on the upper left is a pilot wings that were worn by the pilot and aircraft commander, Bob Morgan. On the bottom left is a brace that, that was worn by Jim Varinas. And on the right-hand side is a uniform from Scott Miller. That was the crewman that Dr. Friedman talked about who had joined the crew late and wasn't able to go on the war bond tour. So in some ways, he's kind of the lost crewman because he just disappears. And most of the photos that you see of the Memphis Bell crew are publicity photos when they were on the war bond tour or getting ready to go back. So he, he just kind of disappears. So it's really wonderful to have his presence in the, in the exhibit. On the bottom left, you see a, a flight suit worn by Bill Winchell, who also shot down an FW-190 on the crew's last mission, along with a ditty bag. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, British flying boots that were worn by Bob Hansen, the radio operator. And he wore those while he was on the Memphis Bell, so quite remarkable. We also have um, been given a generous donation by the family of William Wyler. Uh, Catherine Wyler and her brother generously donated one of William Wyler's uniforms from World War II. And for those of you that might not know, Catherine Wyler was the co-producer of the 1990 movie of the Memphis Bell, which was a kind of a Hollywood fictionalized portrayal of the Memphis Bell. So that will be on display. And William Wyler flew two combat missions with the Memphis Bell crew. He also flew five combat missions total and he was risking his life every time he got on those airplanes. And he didn't have to do it, but he was incredibly patriotic. And as Dr. Friedman talked about, it's really his vision is the reason why we have the amazing movie that, that uh, was shown in 1944. On the right-hand side, we see uh, uh, a humorous decoration called the Order of the Rigid Digit. <laughs> and uh, that was created by Colonel Stanley Ray, the 91st Bomb Group Commander. And he donated a, a wonderful collection in the 1970s. And this material has been in storage, as museums do, uh, protect and store for study and for possible future display. These artifacts have been in storage since the 1970s. And now we get this opportunity to display them with the Memphis Bell. And uh, Colonel Ray flew two missions with the Memphis Bell crew when he was leading the group in combat. So, it's just wonderful to have these personal objects that will be with the aircraft. And these things have not been in the same place together since 1943. Think about that, 75 years ago. And then these things will be together for decades to come for everyone to enjoy and remember and learn from. We will also have two videos in the exhibit. Uh, they will be taken from footage in the outtakes. And a lot of this footage that are in these, uh, in these videos have never been shown publicly before. So this is a real treat. And on the bottom, so uh, the bottom two photos, you see where the Memphis Bell took its heaviest damage. On the bottom left, uh, you see that there's a hole in the vertical tail and a pretty big hole in the rudder. On the right-hand side, you see what happened to the other side of the tail from that damage. And then on the upper right is that's a still from footage right after the 25th mission. And again, you don't see this in the 1944 movie. So um, there'll be some uh, really interesting archival footage that will be in the videos that uh, have not been shown publicly before. And then in that exhibit that's surrounding the Memphis Bell, the strategic, strategic bombing exhibit, well, there'll be some pretty amazing artifacts, uh, some of which show the real violence of what these young men faced. It's, it's uh, difficult to portray that. Photos can show it to some degree, but I don't know that uh, black and white photos have the same visceral effect as seeing a 45 caliber pistol that has been bent from a piece of flak. And um, that pistol will be on display. You know, you think uh, that that crewman had that holstered, and if that gun wasn't there, what would that flak have done to his body? 
um, but that it probably saved his life. And on the right-hand side, uh, we will have the Collier Trophy, the 1944 Collier Trophy. It was awarded to General Spots um, for his role and leadership in the air campaign against Germany. So some, some wonderful artifacts as well in the strategic bombing exhibit. We'll also have some uh, really interesting macro artifacts. Of course, the bell has the top turret and the ball turret, but it's kind of hard to see, especially the top turret. So we will have two turrets that will be on display separate from the aircraft that visitors will be able to look at. And then, of course, on the left-hand side is the, the deadly 88, which even after the heavy bomber campaign broke the back of the German Air Force, the 88 remained a deadly weapon against our bomber crews right to the end of the war. And the 88 has been repainted from its desert configuration or camouflage as it was displayed for many decades. It has been repainted as a typical 88 millimeter gun that would be in use in Europe against our heavy bombers. Another really interesting uh, part of the heavy bombing exhibit is that it will have this animated map. And this map will, through about three minutes, show the strikes that took place in Europe along with the advance of ground forces and also tracking tonnage dropped and the number of bombers lost in time. So it will visually show the whole campaign in about three minutes. And it starts out very, very slow, but by the end it is astounding, the, the scale and magnitude of the heavy bomber campaign, particularly toward the end you see what a devastating effect it had on Germany. Also, as you look at the tonnage dropped and the number of bombers lost, that is also staggering. We lost more than 8,000 heavy bombers, more than 8,000 B-17s and B-24s in combat in the fight against Germany. So the last part of the, the Memphis Bell Project here at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force is our event. It's really our celebration. We are celebrating a national treasure being put on display we're celebrating all the work of everyone who for decades here in Memphis, who have cared for this aircraft, who've restored this aircraft, who have taken care of the artifacts, who have researched um, our folks who are putting together the special event and our public affairs who have been telling the world about this amazing artifact, all the people at the museum, and celebrating the heavy bomber crewmen, in particular those who gave their lives so that we can be free. And the events are going to be absolutely fantastic. There will be three days of events starting on the 17th of May, of course, 75 years to the day that the crew finished their 25th mission. And it will last for three days. There will be B-17s coming in, World War II fighters, reenactors. And we've been working with the reenactors using some of the detailed information we have about the Memphis Bells missions and who is on them so that they have accurate storylines to tell. There'll be World War II vehicles. There'll be a concert with World War II music, uh, band, big band music, a movie festival, and guest speakers. Um, so it's really something that, uh, that uh, we really can't miss. If you have any interest in, in air power or World War II, or B-17s, or you just want to come out and just enjoy a wonderful series of events, it's really something not to be missed. And then if you'd like uh, further information about the events, you can go to our website, and uh, that's continuously updated if there are any new developments. A handful of questions here, and the first question is, do you have the original copy of the photo of Margaret that Robert Morgan put in the uh, cockpit of the uh, Memphis in, Bell? In the compass uh, correction card. No, we did not have it, but um, what yours truly did, um, how many of y'all remember film cameras and dark rooms and solutions and stuff like that? Well, yes. I took, the, there's a picture um, of Morgan sitting in the cockpit and Margaret's picture is in the compass correction card, okay? I took that picture into the dark room, basically did a one-to-one -one reproduction of that picture, and I gave it to um, Roger Deere, and maybe, it, we had it in the airplane in Memphis. Uh, that one got lost, but I had duplicates, so um, hopefully um, it would be a great source of pride if that's in there. Yeah, it, it, uh, it will be in the airplane. And uh, if that structure's there before the rollout, it will be in there before the rollout. So 
Um, uh, next question was, what was the first B-24 to complete 25 missions? Um, I would be happy <laughs> to go. answer that one. So uh, I imagine that the uh, answer that is being looked for is hot stuff. It was a B-24 that was uh, an 8th Air Force bomber, and it was sent down to North Africa, flew a number of missions in North Africa, and then came back to the UK to finish up its tour flying over Europe. Um, that was the first B-24 to finish uh, 25 missions. It was also the first 8th Air Force heavy bomber to finish 25 missions. What Hot Stuff was not is it was not the first heavy bomber to finish 25 missions. That was a, a B-17 in the Pacific. We know one for sure called Suzy Q that flew its 25 missions and came back to the U.S. I think in October, maybe even earlier. So the first heavy bomber to finish 25 missions was not in Europe, it was in the Pacific. And also too, the uh, hot stuff was not the first heavy bomber to finish 25 combat missions over Europe because about half the missions that they flew were in the Mediterranean. So they were, they were bombing North African ports, Bizert. They were doing patrols over the Mediterranean. So the first B-24 to finish 25 missions, combat missions, was hot stuff. The first 8th Air Force heavy bomber to finish 25 missions was hot stuff. But it was not the first heavy bomber to finish 25 missions. It's ironic because with all of these firsts, every single one of them has some qualifier. Um, and we don't know for sure what the first heavy bomber was to finish 25 missions because of the nature of the war in the Pacific at that time. The, the records are fragmented. The, many of the records were lost. I don't know that we ever will. But we know for a fact that Suzy Q flew those 25 missions and came back home long before any of the heavy bombers in Europe came anywhere near close to 25 missions. And in fact, there was a book written called Suzy Q. So um, it's things like that that keep me in a job and uh, keep Harry busy, so do any other? No, okay, uh, so next question. I read that some B-17s were field modified with an additional 30 caliber machine gun located in the tail section. Does the Memphis Bell have that additional 30 caliber machine gun? No. Yeah, it does not. It act it's actually the reverse. When it came out of the factory at that period of time, they were equipping, the government was equipping with 30 caliber machine guns at the beginning. It was after it would have been in combat for a while, many of the Arab, they started switching over to 50 calibers, and that's what Jeff so adequately showed, the uh, framework that was built for the 50 caliber because it was so much heavier, it put a strain on the nose. Now, Chuck Layton, the navigator, told me one time that even with the 50 calibers, he used to slip an uh, extra 30 caliber under his navigator table on the right side of the airplane. Uh, uh, but he, he always had a uh, extra 30 caliber just because he, that's what he trained in and that's what he felt comfortable with. Um, next question, can you clarify the 25 missions over Europe and return to the U U.S.? Europe is key, correct? Um, I can answer that one. The Memphis Bell was the first heavy bomber to return to the U.S. after flying 25 combat missions over Europe. That is a factual statement. That isn't why the Memphis Bell is important. It was a first, just like all the other ones, it's qualified. But that's not what's important about the Memphis Bell, no more than the famous flag at Mount Suribachi wasn't the first flag raised on Mount Suribachi. However, that said, there are a number of firsts. So the first heavy bomber to finish 25 missions over Europe, as best as we know, is Hell's Angels. Right. Uh, um, and I believe it was 13th or 14th of April. The first 8th Air Force heavy bomber to finish 25 missions was hot stuff and so on and so forth. I'm sure that there were other heavy bombers that finished 25 missions before the Bell did. The key here is that the Bell was the first to come home after 25 missions over Europe. And an additional qualifier, there's a phrase that he didn't say which should be left off and that is for many years it, the phrase added was with its entire crew intact. And as I hope we learned from my talk, well, that was... that question, Harry, and take it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Any, Conveniently. Anybody know the yeah. answer to this? Yeah, we planned your... plan this this way. <laughs> Segway. Yeah. Laurel and Hardy here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did the original crew complete 25 missions in the Memphis Bell? No. End of story. No, no. In fact, I went through, before I came up here, just to be sure, I went through all the crew mission lists 
No one member of the crew flew all of his missions on the bell. Okay. Yeah, if, if, if you have to explain that to a visitor, this is it in a nutshell. There's something we kind of call the core crew. That's about the eight guys who flew most of their missions together and most of those missions on the bell. That's what we call the core crew. The core crew flew 20 of their missions on the bell and five of their missions on another B-17. Conversely, the Memphis Bell flew 20 of its missions with the core crew, and it flew five missions with a replacement crew. That's where we get the 54 airmen. Most of them are from the replacement crew or from the co-pilots that constantly rotated in the right-hand seat of the Bell, because the original co-pilot only flew five missions in the Bell, then got his own airplane. And don't, and don't forget this disparity also. We're celebrating the 25th mission on May 17th. That was the crew's 25th mission. Memphis Bell didn't complete its 25th mission until the 19th with an entirely different crew. So we are ending the celebra celebratory events on the day that the Memphis Bell flew its 25th mission. So it's all kosher. It's all planned that way. So uh, uh, why one red and one blue swimsuit on the nose art? Answer that one, Harry. Been a couple of uh, stories about that. One would suggest that the red and blue, which if this were true would have been green, was to demote, denote uh, port and starboard. Um, actually, um, and, and there's a lot of myths here that we can't really control, we don't, haven't found, is that Morgan told whoever was painting it, paint it whatever color you want. And that was supposed to correspond to the wheel covers also. One was red and one was blue. But um, we don't have good document. It's one of those things we keep searching for, but we don't have good documentation on that. Uh, we had two questions on this one. Are any of the crew members still alive? The answer is no. Uh, last crew member died in 2005. And then uh, why, what do the stars above the bombs represent? And that's a complicated question without a definitive answer. I think we can both kind of answer it. The stars, as best as I can tell, represent when the Bell was a lead aircraft in a formation. What formation that is, we can't say, I can't say for sure. It could be that red was when it was lead group aircraft and yellow was when it was the deputy group commander or deputy lead was in the airplane. It could mean when they were lead in the squadron of the flight. None of the stars line up. I haven't found a pattern, a perfect pattern yet. Um, you know, I'm still looking at it, and other people have looked at it as well. So I say it was, they represent when the Bell was um, a, for, a formation lead aircraft. Uh, that's true. We had the same problem. We've gone through independently and together and really can't find a rhyme or reason. The good thing here is that uh, all of these unsettled controversies give us a reason to continue existing. Yep. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Uh, next question, do I have it correct that 51% of all U.S. Air Force combat deaths occurred in heavy bombers over Europe, 1942 to the present? Um, yes, except it's 1917 to the present. So 51% of the Air Force's combat deaths in its entire history from 1917 to now were heavy bomber crewmen in the fight against Germany. So all of the other category is World War I, Everyone else who fought in the Army Air Forces in World War II, including fighter pilots in Europe, medium bombers, light bombers, everyone in the Pacific, Korea, Vietnam, and modern operations are the other 49%. Think about that. Uh, the way that I see it is half of the Air Force's combat deaths in this huge institution are in that corner in the World War II gallery, and we just don't realize that. We just don't understand that. That's not in the public's mind. And even in enthusiasts, it's just not understood or known how many people we lost. There were 20,000 Marines killed in combat in World War II, in all of World War II. There were more than 30,000 heavy bomber crewmen killed in the fight against Germany. And we know that from original statistical records that are in the National Archives. I have not seen these numbers in secondary sources. We went to the National Archives three times. We went through 68 boxes of statistics that the Air Force kept. 
And also, something that's not well known is that there were 20,000 airmen that they never found their bodies. And that never shows up in any of the statistics. And you can go to the DPMO website, Defense Prisoner and Missing Organization, today, and you can read every single one of those 19,962 airmen's names, what unit they were in, and where they were lost. So I've gone through every single one of those names and isolated out. There were a little more than 6,000 heavy bomber crewmen. That just doesn't show up. And it's, it's really a reflection of how huge and catastrophic that World War II was, that they just weren't able to account for everybody. It was all around the world. It was in the Arctic. It was in the, the, the desert wastelands in North Africa. It was in Alaska, in the, in the vast expanses of the Pacific. So as best as we can tell, about 31 to 33,000 heavy bomber crewmen were killed in the fight against Germany. It, it truly matters that we remember what they did. That's all that one. The circular colored lights on the tail gunner's position, what were they used for? These were, uh, and part of this was an adaptation uh, um, that the British may have used <clears throat> in their formations, although we have the plans, the blueprints from the Cheyenne Mod Center. Um, the, there are two um, explanations. One is that it was an indication from the lead aircraft when a certain color, and it depended on what the code was that day, the, the lead aircraft would signal the other aircraft to drop their bombs. Um, the other was, and this is more the British explanation, is that uh, the um, mechanism was a little more complex so that there was a warning with one light, open your bomb doors, and then the next light would be uh, to um, uh, drop the bombs. Um, we're, that's another, one of the things we're still searching. Uh, there's some questions about some of the um, markings that are on the aircraft, DF and A. Um, DF represented the squadron. Every squadron had a two-letter code. And then the Memphis Bell was aircraft A in, the, in their formation or in the unit. There was an aircraft B, an aircraft C, D, and so on and so forth. If that airplane got shot down, there, you know, might, there might be another B or C or D aircraft. And a lot of that had to do with as they were forming up, or if aircraft uh, somehow got separated from their formation, they would know what group it was, what squadron it was. I find it kind of ironic that they camouflage the airplanes and then they put these really bright yellow <laughs> letters on the side of them. Um, then there's some questions about the names by the gunner's windows, if you'd like to address those, Harry. Well, some we know are wives and girlfriends. Other names, we don't know who they are. <laughs> the crew were not talking. And um, so we just, because it's historically verifiable that they were there, we may not always know. Irene, of course, was Bob Hansen's wife. Uh, Denny was uh, Chuck Layton's uh, nickname for his wife. Um, but some of the others, uh, Sally, we don't know who Sally is. We don't know who Virginia is. So maybe some of the in-between crewmen might have something to do with the names being on there because these were the positions they flew in. But we've never been able to document that. It, what, All of them. what we do know, though, is, well, we do know whether those names were on there shortly after the 25th mission or where they show up later in the war bond tour. So, like, for instance, Sally was just S, and somewhere mm -hmm. in that three weeks or so, it became Sally. And so. then if you look at that S, it really looks more like a coiled snake. Yeah. So yeah. that... Seems. Having a clue what it means. <laughs> um, what was the most serious battle damage suffered by the bell, and how long was it out of service? I like it when I see um, descriptions of the bell's tail being shot away. I've seen pictures of aircraft where the tails were shot away and they were going down. Okay. We've got some pretty dramatic, though, flak damage photos of the vertical stabilizer uh, being um, uh, damaged. Uh, outer wing panels had to be replaced. Um, there is that picture, you may have caught a glimpse of it, where we were illustrating uh, Quinlan's position. That, that burst had to have taken place kind of inside because the, the shrap, the, the, this suggests an inside job. Um, and he did get um, more than a pin scratch, he calls it. Um, but the, probably the most significant was, uh, the, I would say from the pictures I've seen, the vertical stabilizer 
and uh, and oh and early on there was damage to the horizontal stabilizers as well yeah the uh, that damage that that dr. Friedman talked about forced them to completely replace the tail and the rudder so the rudder or the tail and a uh, vertical tail vertical stabilizer and the rudder that the bell came over with uh, it did not come home with the same one and also uh, I had that still of the bell with that damage on the tail in one of the videos in the exhibit you will see the Memphis Bell flying with that damage and what's absolutely astounding is as it pans over the bomb bay doors are open so the bell was on the bomb run with that damage which it just is incredible and the fact that that was recorded in color by somebody is incredible and, and a postscript to that we the museum has in their collection when when the ground crew got a hold of the aircraft uh, when they came back, the uh, lead mechanic, in this case Joe Jambrone, would die, had a, a mimeographed outline of the of the B-17, and would uh, indicate where the damage was in that particular mission. Uh, and we have the original that uh, was filled out, labeled uh, Memphis Bell 285, and it shows where those those uh, flak hits occurred. Yeah, what's, what's been really wonderful is that um, some of the items that um, Harry and the MBMA transferred to us, artifacts coming from the uh, Memphis Bell families, uh, they've donated three diaries, three of the crewmen. We have their combat diaries now. And so all of these things are, are brought together. So you have this confluence of material like, like what Dr. Friedman was talking about. We have the aircraft, we have film of the aircraft with this damage, and then original combat uh, reporting, damage reporting by the crew chief. So it's all of these things coming together are creating something that never existed before and then will be preserved in perpetuity. And if I could put in one, one more plug for the city of Memphis and its foresight. When the bell came back from Altus, the log books and maintenance records were still on the airplane. The mayor immediately ordered that those books, those maintenance logs, be turned over to the public library for safekeeping. Later on, um, when I mentioned this to General Metcalf, he immediately got a hold of the folks at the library and uh, basically the library has donated them back to the museum. We made, or folks here made high resolution copies to be kept in the uh, Memphis library, but thank God those original documents uh, survived the airplane. And they, and they have also been absolutely invaluable evidence to be able to confirm when the damage was, what happened, when the airplane wasn't flying, modifications that were done to it. So that's a, I'm glad you brought that up, Harry. Uh, another question, which side did the navigator's table get installed on? I, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the first crack at that one. Um, I remember there was speculation about this early in the, res in the restoration. There was. And the answer to that is in one frame in 11 and a half hours of footage in the outtakes. And um, we had that question for more than a decade. There is one frame in a shot during the stop at Long Beach in California at the Douglas, Douglas plant and whoever was taking the footage was shooting out of the navigator's window and shooting the crowd framed by this window. And when they were done, they took their finger off the trigger or whatever ran the camera, and they dropped the camera down. Well, as cameras were at the time, they still continue to run just for a moment. The last frame of this shot is pointed at the top of the navigator's table that was on the left-hand side. The navigator's tables in B-17Fs at that time were dropped. Now, in the case of the bell, there's a drift meter that's sitting there. In the case of other B-17Fs at the time, and it's in many, many photos, the table was dropped maybe three inches or four inches. On those airplanes, I have no idea why they did that, because there's no reason to do that. So that's one navigator's table. On the right-hand side, there is a small table, very small table. There were remnants of it in the airplane many, many years ago. And then also there are at least two photographs of B-17s in the 91st bomb group that had this small navigator's table. In fact, and both of them, I believe, have some kind of instrument that was embedded in the table. Uh, I can't say for sure why they put a second navigator's table there. All we know is that there's photo evidence. So there was a navigator's table on the left-hand side 
that was dropped, like all the other B-17Fs around that time, and then there was a small navigator's table on the right-hand side. Now, tantalizingly, there are two different spots in the outtakes, and there are photos of navigators using the table on the right that are completely covered by the maps that they're using. So we know something's there, but we can't see it. But there are two photos that show small navigators' tables on the right-hand side on other B-17s at the time. So there were two. My turn. Okay, yep. <laughs> Um, I think this is a good time to uh, plug the book, Memphis Bell, Dispelling the Myths, because a, a lot of this is discussed somewhat in there, but we've expanded the discussion since then, and it's in, available in the um, bookstore. Um, Chuck Layton, who was the navigator, visited Memphis uh, a couple of times, and different ones of us uh, talked about this with him. Uh, he mentions, he says that the net table was moved from the uh, port side to the starboard side, um, but that it was smaller than the regulation and what the blueprints called for. And indeed, uh, the ratty table that we see um, that one of our fellows shot when it was on the uh, pedestal uh, shows the table there. It's pretty ratty, but it's much smaller than the uh, blueprints would have called for. Um, and also, there was another crewman, a letter that I received from a chap who had flown on the bell at McDill when it was used as a trainer. And he writes, uh, I was uh, surprised when I got into the uh, nose and I see the navigator table on the wrong side, sitting on the right side. So uh, the discussion goes on and maybe the true story is there were both. So, so we're at uh, 325. I think we have time if anybody has any other questions. Uh, there's uh, one in the back, sir. Um, the question is, is there going to be a book about the restoration? Uh, I think that's a possibility, um, but we don't have any firm plans right now, but I could see that definitely happening sometime in the future. But the, our, uh, I will make the point that our videographer and uh, our superstar cameraman, um, Ken LaRock, has been documenting the Memphis Bell in a way that we have never had a restoration documented. He's filming me right now. Um, it's just, it, he has taken thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs and we are so grateful for the work that he's done because um, the, the documentation of the restoration is astounding. So, I, think, I think he should be given the William Wyler Award. It sounds, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah some, kind of, uh, some kind of statue, so. <laughs> A rigid digit. Yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions, yeah. sir? Uh, at Boeing in uh, Seattle. Plant number two in, Be in Seattle. Question? What was the total number of airmen that were in, that flew in Europe in World War II under heavy bombers? Do you know? I don't think I have, I don't think I know. You know, I, that's a question that I want to figure out, but I have not gotten to that point. Um, I, can, uh, I can tell you maybe as some comparisons, not a total number, but the odds of finishing a tour for a crewman um, were one in four at the time that the Memphis Bell was flying its missions. It stayed pretty bad through all of 1943. It wasn't really until 1944 that the odds really started to improve, but we continued to lose aircraft left and right. It's just the formations were bigger and it was sustainable. That's when they started raising the totals from 25 to 30 and 30 to 35. Of course, implicit in your question is if you know the percentage killed, you have to know the original number they started from to get that percentage. And um, people were pretty loose with uh, uh, early on with saying the the losses were 80, at 80 percent. Oh, yeah. uh, here's another example too. There's a study in the statistical summaries and statistical um, files that were at the National Archives. They they actually did a study on what were the odds of of a crewman being lost, and they uh, looked at the four four groups that were in the Eighth Air Force. They looked at other uh, units flying in Europe, they looked at Army Air Forces in general flying across the world, and then they picked what they felt was the most dangerous and hot action on the ground. And at that time they determined it was being an infantryman at the front lines in North Africa. So this is not artillery or supply, it's infantrymen in the foxholes shooting and getting shot at. And in, that, in, that, um, in those statistics, 
they determined that a heavy bomber crewman who was in one of those four groups was six times likely, six times more likely to become a casualty than an infantryman at the front lines at the worst fighting at the time. And then they also determined that they were 14 times more likely to become a total loss. So that would be include shot down and captured, killed, or wounded so badly they couldn't continue. So to me, those are, those are pretty shocking statistics. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for your time, and we really appreciate your interest in the bell. And please come out and join in celebrating uh, the display of this wonderful American icon.